Good deal. Good deal. Yeah. Welcome back to the Mountain Morning Show, where I'm very happy to have a friend here in studio. John Goodwin is here with Galaxy Press. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Joe. Great to be here in Park City. Yeah, this beats the heck out of uh, talking via Skype, but uh, we still like that because it means we get to keep up with you and what's going on with Galaxy Press, and it's been an exciting year. It's been very exciting. Yeah. And when we were here last year, we talked about the release of Battlefield Earth, which was monumental release for us. I'll we had number one in the United States for both the book and the audiobook. Right. Re-release, we should say. Re-release, right, because it was originally released in 1980. Yeah. And so throughout the whole year, we've been, you know, selling the book, selling the, um, the whole idea of people reading is actually what we're trying to do as a publisher. Yeah. And what's very exciting for us is that we published the uh, fiction works of L. Ron Hubbard. Wow. And one thing that, um, you know, we talked about him having a release the book Battlefield Earth right. earlier on, but what actually came of this was in 1930s and 40s, Alvin Hubbard was one of the most popular writers of fiction in America. A very prolific writer. He very was prolific. Churning out a book a day sometimes, kind of amazing. It might seem like that, yeah. yeah. He was writing like 100,000 words a month. <laughs> it's and amazing. we have amazing. this book here, Master Storyteller, which pretty much goes over the overview of all the different books that he wrote. But as a, a writer of fiction, he wrote in mystery, western, adventure, science fiction, fantasy, and all the different genres. Um, gave him an audience that when he, re when he went into finally writing science fiction, they were able to appreciate the fact that his ability to write with realism, he was originally a, an adventure writer, right. and um, being able to write with that realism, that, that brought science fiction to what we now know as the golden age. Right. I have to say about L. Ron Hubbard, because I, I, we've had the opportunity, of, I had the chance to come down and spend some time at right. uh, his library and uh, at Galaxy Press and some time to spend with among all of those uh, books that he's written and, and articles as well. And what was always impressive to me wasn't just that he was writing about adventure, it was the fact that he was living it first. Right. Which is what I think it really makes it so that it's so much more attainable and uh, and and makes it feel like it's part of what you uh, it a part of your experience too as you read it as a as a reader. Yeah, he was. Um, I mean, at the time he was America's youngest Eagle Scout. He had just turned 13 when he became Eagle. Uh, he was uh, obviously he was a veteran of World War II. He was a, a Navy lieutenant. Right. He was a um, master mariner. He was licensed to sail any ocean. In the uh, in in the world, and he was also a member of the Explorers Club, a very famed um, club of explorers. The you know the the guys that went on the moon, right? They're members of the Explorers Club. That's one of the flags that doesn't get promoted, but that's also on the moon too. The Explorers Club. So he flew. How about that? He flew the flag three times, and so with all his experience, it gave him a lot of fodder for his stories. Yeah. And so when he was brought in by Street and Smith, which is the publisher at the time, yeah. um, which took over a, a new publication called Astounding, and they had a, the editor on board and said, look, it, so take everything that this author writes, because we're going to change the face of science fiction to make it instead of the ray guns and robots to add people to it, which is what was done. And so the various stories, there's um, one that I've, if I can show it here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a Matter of Manor, for example, is one of the ones that was, um, that was written. Beyond All Weapons was one of the first stories ever written that discussed the, the um, time dilation theory, which um, was a very major, at that time, breakthrough when, it, when he first studied it at George Washington University, the whole thing from Einstein's theory you know, of relativity. Theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the first stories that ever addressed that whole subject. Wow. So that was the whole thing of that, that changing of science fiction that went from science fact to, you know, like, I wonder if we can make this happen. And that's what he was able to do when that golden age was really going on. And he describes it, well, then it wasn't golden age. It was just a lot of amazing ideas that were being developed. You know, I love these books because they are written very much like the radio plays of the time, the golden age of radio, mm -hmm. kind of coming uh, full circle at that point uh, with great writers, with uh, the fact that we were moving towards film as well and television. Things were changing dramatically, but yet the storytelling being the center part of that, L. Ron Hubbard was right at the heart. He was. <laughs> and even on the release of these books newly in the uh, uh, last 10 years or so, 
Publishers Weekly stated that he was one of the, uh, one of the mainstays of popular fiction of the 20th century. And so, as, a, as a, one, of the popularizers of the oh, one of the most popularizers of the 20th century, he then, in celebration of 50 years as a writer, come out and wrote Battlefield Earth. Which is epic in proportion. I mean, this is a thick book. Uh, what is it? Uh, 1,000 and uh, what, 12, 1,300 something pages. So good grief. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a whole um, lot. Yeah, we've got a, a photo uh, here as well we're going to show you of the cover. And uh, this being the 21st century edition, this expanded content includes not only uh, the author interview, but a discussion, a discussion guide for teachers. Right. This the is pr particularly awesome because as you and I have talked about, this book has become, for many people, uh, generational, uh, which you're seeing at Comic-Con and we're excited about this weekend. Very. You know we're going to see a dad come in with their son or their daughter and say, this is a good book, one I read, it inspired me to read more, and they're going to be buying that book for their kid. Yeah, a lot, of, um, a lot of the people that are now parents read the book originally when they were just teens, you know, 13, 14, right. some are 12 years old. But it's also a story that military, we find a lot of the military right. really love this story. Carry that one around in your big pocket. Exactly, your big pocket, pants. your duffel bag, yeah. exactly. But one thing that's really good for us here in, in Salt Lake City is that it's a very literate community. Yeah. And this is why I, I love Salt Lake we City. We love to read and we sure love to write too. Yeah. So with this, uh, being able to, uh, to bring out this, this book and this discussion guide makes it possible for those who are trying to get into science fiction to be able to, um, to like, how can I read this book and what can I expect to get out of it? We have STEM teachers that have very much used this because of the science in the book that can be created right now that right. they're able to do with their students. Wow, I love that, but I have to admit, uh, that I am a little bit of a sucker for the audiobook. <laughs> as much as I would love to sit down and go through this over this, the course of a summer on a nice mm -hmm. beach somewhere, the truth is I still have to work. So I have these long <laughs> commutes, and I am a big fan of the audiobooks. This one particularly my favorite, and not just me, a lot of people say this because you guys cast it, and there mm -hmm. are a whole lot of characters in the audiobook of Battlefield Earth. We have um, 67 actors, performing 198 wow. characters. We created over three hours of original music and <laughs> over 150,000 sound effects went into it. Wow. And what's really great about this one too, which is different than, we, well we wanted to raise the bar in the, in the right. area of audiobooks, which proved out when we won the Audi Award, which is the top honor that's given to audiobooks just recently at the, um, at the award ceremony in New York. And the idea on this was, not just to have the sound of a spaceship or, you know, if you hear a, a sometimes in audiobooks, if you hear a car, it's a car. Right. You know, or if you hear a gun, it's a gun or it's, you know, sure. a plane. What we do is we actually get the, the right sound for that the item, specific the specific thing. sound. Yeah. So if the gun that's being shot is a 30 odd six, it's a 30 odd six you're going to hear. Wow. If it's a pistol, it's a pistol. In some of our audiobooks where you have the subways in New York City, we went to New York City, went down and recorded the subways, wow. the taxis on Fifth Avenue, so that you are getting that exact sound. On, on the aliens, which is obviously this is science fiction, we used uh, more synthesized sounds. So you sure. were able to distinguish the aliens and alien sounds are synthesized, whereas humans are the earthy sounds, the, oh, the real amazing. sounds. So it just makes it just a whole tour de force. So that's why we won the, the award for marketing because of the quality of the audiobook. It raised the, the, uh, the standards such that it increased the number of people listening to audiobooks. Well, you raised the standards in a lot of ways, uh, including when uh, the book was released, a crashed spaceship right on Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard. Yeah. That was pretty exciting. Yeah. But of course, the character as well, who actually might make an appearance on the program tomorrow, so you want to stay tuned for that. But that is what uh, Comic-Con is all about. And of it course, uh, if you want to meet the character, if you want to see more about the book, you're going to want to head to Comic-Con this weekend. Exactly. This will be our, first, our fifth time at uh, uh, Comic-Con, either FanX or the Salt Lake City Comic-Con. So we're very excited to, to be here again. You know, what I have to say about all of this, of course, is that uh, Galaxy Press, very fortunate to have such a known quantity as L. Ron Hubbard because you can do amazing things, which you've done with uh, almost a guarantee of success, and you've certainly seen that. It has been uh, very exciting. And what that also means is that with, the, with that uh, mm -hmm. ability and that 
guaranteed success. You could look at new authors, and uh, I'm excited that when we come back, we'll be talking about that as we talk about writers and illustrators of the future and the L. Ron Hubbard legacy right after this. Welcome back to the Mountain Morning Show, where we're continuing our conversation with John Goodwin of Galaxy Press. And I, uh, I got to say, I'm excited for the news uh, as well of the uh, Battlefield Earth uh, most recent edition that you put out. Uh, this, uh, you have another award just from this one alone. Right, just it released um, in the last two weeks, and it, it hit number one in the United States of science fiction mass markets. So we're very excited about that. Wow. So yeah, yet again, another award for Battlefield Earth. When you take it as a whole, it's got to be one of the most awarded books out there, I'm guessing. It's it works impressive. for me. Impressive, yeah. That is just uh, outrageous. But you know, that's something that's really great because, as I mentioned, you, you have L. Ron Hubbard. You are able to put out all of his books. Uh, you're able to put out more audio and do more, which means that that legacy, uh, the ability to go after and continue his legacy with other authors, uh, becomes a reality, which is what uh, Writers of the Future is all about. Uh, he really mm -hmm. always wanted to make sure that other people were writing and, and that people had much to read. That's right. And we found that in Utah we've got some writers uh, that have a lot to say and have ended up in several of these Writers of the Futures volumes. Yeah, we checked and we've had 20 winners from Utah. Wow. The more, more than any, any area in the world. That's amazing. With our three judges also from Utah, we've had... That helps. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have Orson Scott Card. Right. Dave Wolverton. Mm -hmm. And Brandon Sanderson, all brilliant, brilliant people, but right. amazing authors. Indeed, and they've all won at one point or other. Well, they right? were. They, uh, Ursula Scott Card said, "I wish it was around when I started." Yeah, he didn't get liked, to. Yeah. But he's got his book on writing, which he says, "Be sure you enter Writers of the Future." Right. Dave Wolverton won the contest. He was right. our our grand prize winner, I think, for Volume Three. That was like 30 years ago. This is Volume 33. And with that, his career launched. And then Brandon Sanderson was a finalist. He's written three short stories in his career. One of them he submitted to Writers of the Future, became a finalist. And what he told me was that um, this contest gave him that vote of confidence that he needed. Right. He'd been writing for several years and hadn't had any breaks. And he'd written novel after novel after novel and wasn't selling. So he was beginning to doubt whether he was going to continue on you know, right. pursuing a career as a writer. So when he got his, his acknowledgement from Writers of the Future that he was a finalist, he went, wow, somebody's finally acknowledged what I'm doing. And it gave him that little bit of extra push to uh, pursue. And it was right after that that he sold his first novel. And literally, the, the rest is history. He's now one of the most popular fantasy writers in the world. That's amazing. And I, we have to acknowledge the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, many of these writers from Utah have had the benefit of the fact that uh, not only did they get a jump start in their career by being published, but more importantly, they were published in a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> that is impressive. So the, let's kind of give people an idea of the contest itself. Each year, uh, this contest uh, begins anew. Right. And you look for 12, is it? Right. Uh, authors so and 12 it, illustrators. Correct. So right now, the end of the contest year is the end of this month. So people can still get their entries in right. for the writer contest or illustrator contest. And so at the end of September, when, this, when year 34 ends, year 35 begins on October 1st and proceeds so that we have four three-month periods. So right. every three months, three winners are chosen of the writer's contest and of the illustrator's contest. Wow. And we have another winner this year from Salt Lake City. That's exciting. And it's a first because it's the wife of one of our other winners from Salt Lake City. How about that? So that's very cool. So hopefully, we're hoping that uh, maybe on Saturday when we're, you know, if you come to the uh, Comic Con, we can have them there and we can uh, introduce meet them. Meet them as well. Meet them we're as well. We're looking forward to that for yeah. sure. Now, one of the things that uh, I think is uh, exciting to talk about for sure is the fact that uh, illustration has become so much more a part of books. It was once a time when you, you probably looked to, uh, you know, a stock image place to, to come up with a book cover or something like that. And so often now we've got illustrators, especially with science fiction and fantasy, 
creating work specifically for those mm -hmm. books. And that is why now celebrating more of the illustrators has become uh, so popular. And boy, I got to tell you, last time I was at Writers of the Future and Illustrators of the Future, I spent more of my time with the illustrators. And I couldn't help myself yes. because it was amazing. Right. And so on. so that was the black and white oh, you just saw yeah, there. Oh, show some of the now, color. there's the color there of that same image there. How about that? That so that's is the color beautiful. Of that. So we've seen so many uh, incredible pieces of work. Uh, this is probably one of, one of my favorites, arguably, uh, right here. Uh, that was, that was the winner, winner. grand prize winner, winner yeah. from this last year. Yeah, and uh, I just was He's amazed. From Poland. Yeah, we had people from all over the world. Yeah. And I just, I was kind of just blown away by this, and I, I felt, I found myself spending way more time <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the artist. But, uh, you know, we have to remember that all of this is art. The writing right. is art. That's the illustration right. is art. And L. Ron Hubbard has done a heck of a job in making sure that we get to celebrate that with new people getting their opportunity to rise to fame. Right. The, the way it actually, you know, like I said, this is volume 33 that we were just going over there. It actually began the year after Battle of Earth was originally published and in celebration of the 50 years as a writer, the uh, Writers of the Future was an extension of that because of his name in science fiction. He wanted to be able to lend a helping hand and provide a, a, basically a leg up for aspiring writers. And at the point, it was you know getting some of his writer buddies uh, together to help on this thing, to put it together. And they're the ones who judge it. And right now, you've got the top names of science fiction and fantasy who are the contest judges. I named three of them already. Yeah. But there's you know several more. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, we've got uh, arguably one of the biggest Star Wars writers of all who uh, acts as a, typically a judge and often a teacher. Right. Yeah. Well, you're referring to Kevin Anderson? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amazing yeah. talent. Yeah, he's. I couldn't believe I was in the same room. <laughs> That's kind of it's kind of hard to believe. Yeah. But uh, astounding the the opportunity that these writers have because not only do they get to be if they win are they given this opportunity both the illustrators and writers to be in the book and be part of a New York Times bestseller but also the chance to come and, and learn as well as accept their award that's pretty fun. It's I, very, and you very must fun. feel really great about that experience of watching new people uh, as they uh, launch their career. Well, the legacy of this thing is to provide that means so to be able to accomplish that and get the uh, the writers and the artists the ability to, to launch a career. So now we've got several New York Times best-selling authors who have uh, spun off from this contest yeah. as winners. And that's one thing we're very, very excited about that, that, it's, that we're able to do that and continue to do that. And now a person who's a, 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 not just even a winner, but someone who's a finalist can put that into their pitch letter and will sell a story. Wow. Just because of, of what they have to go through to make it up to that level of being a finalist or a winner of Writers of the Future. With entries of, from over 160 countries, it's Amazing. seriously, the, the, it's the biggest writing competition of its type in the world. Well, to find out more, you can, of course, go to Comic-Con this weekend and mm -hmm. uh, speak right to John Goodwin and the other folks from Galaxy Press. Uh, of course, you can go online as well and enter right, there. Writers, uh, writersofthefuture.com is All where right. you rise the future to be able to find out about that and also galaxypress.com to find out about uh, how to get your copies. Thank you so very much John Goodman, Galaxy Press. We will see you at Comic Con for all of us here at the Mountain Morning Show. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. We'll see you tomorrow from 7 to 11 right here on Park City Television.